Hi, Rafaela. How are you? I'm great. Nice to see you. Likewise. Welcome to, to this new show, Economist on Zoom, getting coffee. <laughs> Thank you. And Look, in your oh, honor. There you go. Espresso. Okay, well, you, 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 know, you know about coffee much more than me, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> given where you come from. Um, and Rafael, I, I was very excited when, when I decided to invite you and you said that you uh, were happy to join because I think that you are, I mean, your research to me is fascinating and to many people. And I, I think that in particular, you've done something that deserves a lot of credit for economists, which is together with your co-authors, you, you actually are measuring something that for many decades, people thought it was unmeasurable. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think that, of course, deserves a lot of credit. And, and, and with that measurement, you've been learning. We all have been learning so many things. So, uh, you know, I have my own takes about your research, of course, but I wonder for you, having done all this work, what are the two or three main things that you've been most surprised after looking for to, uh, uh, so much data uh, uh, about managers and CEOs? Yeah. So look, I, I, the thing that surprises me the most every time we do a survey where we measure management practices, you know, if you know my research, you know that we, we actually don't measure rocket science. We measure uh, managerial practices that have been around for the longest time that should be well known by uh, practitioners. And, you know, imagine if an economist knows about them, imagine what a practitioner should know about it, right? right. Um, and every single time we go out in the field and we measure, there is always variation. So to me, the fact that, uh, you know, practices that in, pra in principle should be good for the organization are still uh, finding difficulties in being implemented. To me, that's always something that fascinates me. Where does this variation come from? Especially because in every single um, piece of research that we've done, where we do these correlations between management and performance, you know, I haven't done, my co-author Nick Bloom has done the experiment where, you know, they, they exogenously evaluated management practices. In the work that I've done so far, I've, I've so far only looked at correlations. And there is always this positive correlation between management and performance, being, be it manufacturing, uh, schools, or things that I'm studying more and I'm getting much more excited about hospitals. Um, and so I think that this really, you know, it, it drives my research. How can we close these managerial gaps? And what can we do to, no, it's not just a research question, it's really like a practical practical question. How do we improve uh, performance through better management practices? So you mentioned hospitals, and, and that's something that you've been getting into in the past few years, uh, uh, more and more so, but you know, it seems like you are the right person to explain us now. Uh, I hope so. I, 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 well, I, I wonder your thoughts on, on, you know, we're going through the global pandemic and we're a few months in and you know, yeah. when, when, when we look at the, at the strategy, if anything, of different countries is the whole idea of reducing, of flattening the curve, basically, or one of the most important ideas is to, is not to strain the public health system, right? I mean, that's, yeah. uh, nobody's saying we're going to avoid the epidemic at all. It's just, let's not all get sick at the same time. Uh, let's not do that. So yeah. in a sense, that has a lot to do with the resources in the public sector, in the, in the, in the public health sector. If you were to um, think that some hospitals uh, were gonna collapse more than others, or some areas would collapse more than others, to how much you attribute that to management, for instance? Yeah. So this is exactly the type of question that I think I'll spend the next five years studying. So I don't have, you know, I don't have the quantitative evidence yet. I'm very excited because in the fall with the census, we'll launch a survey where we, we will measure management practices for hopefully what will be thousands of hospitals in the United States. And we, I'll be able, five years from now, Danny will have another coffee. And, That's you know, good. I'll be able to tell you, I can tell you my hunch so far. Right. And I think that my hunch that is based, by the way, on conversations and uh, interviews that we've done in Italy and in, in the U.S. in part, is that to some extent what happened with COVID depends on central organizational features. So there is an element of the response that 
um, has been left to hospitals, unfortunately, but should have centralized and should have, should have been centralized and organized much better um, at the national level. I am thinking about Italy at the very beginning. I'm thinking about the US right now. What has lacked is this health policy response of coordinating, for example, the procurement of uh, protective equipment. You know, that's, that has played, unfortunately, a major role in driving infections in medical workers. At the, on the other hand, the more you look at individual cases, the more you realize that some hospitals, given these constraints that they were living in, have actually been amazing at coordinating very rapidly a response to this emergency. If you read what ha what's happened in the hospitals, a lot of it actually was left to the discretion of the hospital managers. So one of the things that I read that to me is fascinating, I really recommend you reading it, is this account of the medical director of one of the hospitals in Italy, in Lodi, that was mm -hmm. really taken, you know, the, they had a huge surge in cases within weeks. And um, the, uh, his name is Massimo Lombardo. He was describing all the measures that the hospital took to change, for example, how teams were composed and how information was gathered and processed. So, you know, think about it. You have a limited staff and you have to deal with an enormous amount of cases. If you don't change the allocation of resources, uh, there is no way you can manage it. And so, I mean, this is just to say that my, my sense is, and I hope we can get this through data, maybe we'll get this, uh, this through qualitative research. I think that the real surprise and in a positive sense here is how much of the managerial tasks the doctors were able to take on themselves and how much of this reorganization across teams and people and collaboration really happened within the hospitals. The reason why this gives me hope is that breaking those silos in hospitals is typically very hard. Having people collaborate seamlessly in hospitals is a managerial challenge, one of the big, one of the, you know, most serious right. ones. You know, having specialists working together, but in the moment of emergency that happened. And so I think we really have to understand much more about, you know, how do we make this happen without having a huge crisis and a tragedy impending on us. But I, I, I leave, in a sense with, you know, with a sense of hope, let's say, that we'll be able to right. leverage this experience. To what extent do you think, though, that, uh, you know, when you're studying management in different settings, uh, some people will tend to think, well, some people are born to be better managers, some people are just not, don't have those skills. Um, or, or is it more like what we expect that would happen, you know, God forbid, if there are more pandemics that we have the experience and that, uh, you know, having the, the, the bad experience have taught us, uh, you know, how to overcome these issues in the future. I, so look, I teach in a business school. Exactly, so, it's a bad know, question for somebody who for a living teaches business and management. <laughs> I, you know, I really think that there is, I really think that managers, you know, some characteristics are innate, maybe, but a lot you can learn. The thing is, you learn from experience. So you learn from working with other people, you, work, you learn from observing what other people do, informal networks, and I know that you study informal networks, Danny, so you know, uh, you've seen it in your research too. Um, there is a lot that happens in um, uh, management practices that is not codifiable. And so you really right. have to live it, see it, and maybe even convince yourself that practices matter so that you have the strength to bring it back to your organization and change routines. You right. know, like, uh, and, and to some hard. extent, basically, when, when we go to business school, uh, you know, we're learning cases. So we're basically learning about the experience of other people. I mean, it's not, yeah. you, you teach a little, some, a little bit of theory, but basically we're teaching a lot of those experiences. So, so I think that that makes we sense. We try, right? Yeah, I mean, the case study is a way to simulate that experience in the classroom. Um, yes. I love teaching executives because you know when you and right now i'm in the middle of an executive program so that's maybe you know it's fresh in my memory but you have no idea how much information there is in this executive program in the class you know the professor is a catalyzer of these experiences i think that they learn tremendously from hearing what other people are doing and why they've done it so that tells me that there is a big chunk of management that you can learn um, there is also, you know, a piece of it, which is how do you persuade other people, you know, being a manager doesn't mean ordering people around, 
that's a, you know that's a misconception being a good manager means being able to persuade people to follow your lead right and um, and all that i think it's something that perhaps it's uh, you know harder to harder to learn um, maybe there is more more of an innate trait there but even there i have hope and well that that's exactly another like you know unconventional wisdom that maybe you you've been teaching all of us which is what ceos are doing the whole day and, and not, <laughs> right so <laughs> so you have this amazing uh data set that you've compiled and a whole project on, on the times of executives looking at exactly what ceos are saying that are doing and what they're actually doing uh on i think 30 minute blocks right on a very precise 15 minutes uh, 15 yeah. minute blocks so so i think that there's some things that, i mean some people uh tend to think that you know the ceo is playing golf and uh well, well first some of all do. To, some, <laughs> exactly some people think about the ceos of the big companies you of course have been learning about ceos of companies at completely different sizes but 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 there in that particular uh you know set of analysis that you've done what are the biggest you, what do you think are the biggest insights well you know those are papers where even measuring is exciting right as you say right. we we didn't know the actual time use of this manager so we were excited to go in and you know proving that you can shadow a thousand ceos you know from a distance and get reliable data the biggest surprise if you like is that a lot of what they do is interactions uh you know we hmm. think about and there is a, i think part of it is the, the the strategy literature we tend to um you know give you this sense that the ceo is this uber rational individual that you know looks outside the window and thinks about what's gonna happen in the next 15 years and you know the guy right. typically is a guy has it all right he knows what to do well it turns out that the role of the ceo uh, is different it's uh, i think i see it more as a as a person that is able to coordinate the expertise of other people and really bring it together more than uh, the ultimate rational decision maker that has everything planned in his mind and and then things happen so that's more about the messiness of organizations i think uh, the fact that we have to spend so much time in acting for things to get done the, the one thing i uh, i also wanted to bring up and ask you is about this uh, recent research that actually came out uh with you uh co-authored by you and and, and, and other co-authors um that i think was featured in the economist on how is our work life after lockdowns right and uh, i mean I, I you know my take which i'm hoping you you can expand and explain us a little bit more but we're basically uh doing many more meetings uh, with uh, much more people uh, which are shorter but we're working more so that sounds to me we we are being i mean those of us who are fortunate to be able to work of course yeah uh, from home uh, we are very being much more productive which maybe uh, some people at, at first would would think working from home is not really what makes more productive but this is a case in point that that it's quite the opposite perhaps i don't know if we are more productive i know i mean i know mm. so the the thing it's not clear that we are working more i think that what's happening is that our work day span has increased right uh, we're working more hours sorry that's what i mean we're working we're, more we hours. have a, we have yeah. a broader span and but it might be that we take breaks so we don't really measure okay. um the actual time uh, time spent working but we know that we start earlier and we end later and I don't even know if we're being more productive. So that's one of okay. those things where it's probably, you know, at the end of the day, we are replacing, you know, the office plays this really important coordinating function. We all meet in the office. We have uh, a lot of interactions that are extemporaneous. The moment the office is moved out of the equation for people who like being in the office in particular, we have to replace these interactions in some other way. So I think what we are capturing, my interpretation of what we're capturing with that, those stats that you, uh, that you were mentioning is that we are trying to replace the extemporaneous interactions with meetings that allow us to coordinate uh, with each other. Um, by the way, we're not measuring informal interactions, which may happen via Slack or all these other informal right. channels. So we are perhaps what we're capturing is really a lower bound on the extent to which we are trying to compensate for the lack of physical extemporaneous interactions with other means of communication. Do you think this spans to different industries or, or this is 
uh, this is for a particular industry or a particular set of industries, more knowledge workers, right? Uh, these are knowledge workers, yeah. So these are white collar workers. It's uh, 3 million and 600,000 people. So we don't know anything about the, you know, obviously for data confidentiality issues, we don't really uh, have so far, we haven't done a breakdown of uh, industries and so far. I, you know, for the white collar worker, my, my, my sense, and I'd love to look at that in the data, is that the, you know, the need for coordination will probably vary according to different types of positions. So I would expect probably managers to be catching up much more with these interactions relative to people that you know, work more independently. So perhaps the life of managers is changing. Yeah, basically people that need to coordinate more are probably going to have more, you know, put more effort in trying to replicate um, their work life in the office. One of the questions I had for you, which if there are grad students uh, tuning in is that, uh, I mean, it's also very impressive how you uh, are able to put uh, these data sets together <laughs> and, uh -huh. and, and how you can reach out to CEOs and get them to share with you their, mm -hmm. their schedules and, you know, and, and find these companies that might be providing some anonymized data and all these. So what's your advice for people who are looking for these, you know, super large, super interesting data sets um, that are not out there and you have to find your way into them? You know, I think I would say the first thing, which was really my luck, uh, was to work in teams that are functional and efficient, right? So I was very, very lucky because I got, as a PhD student, I got sucked into this management research that had just started. And uh, I didn't know that, but actually I had been employed in a da data factory, <laughs> right? <Okay>. Because... <laughs> Because you learn, like I learned so much about, you know, how do you run interviews at scale and across countries uh, so that you, can, you have control over the data quality. So I think these are large endeavors and these are uh, projects that require teams. So, you know, my first, uh, my first suggestion is, we, I know that we tend to put a lot of emphasis on solo work and solo work is really important. But to some extent, if you have a big question, it's very hard these days to get at that alone. So it's something to consider. Um, the second thing is that it's almost become too easy to measure things. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a problem in the sense, um, there are so many, you know, first of all, the respondents, if you're interested in managers or CEOs, they get bombarded with data requests. Uh, so mm -hmm. getting their attention is, uh, is hard and you always want to have something that you can give back that is useful, not just to you as a researcher, but if you get, if you land on an interesting question that is useful also for the participants, uh, that, that, that's what allowed us to collect the data on the time use of managers, of CEOs, because CEOs didn't know how they were spending their time. And mm. they were very interested in understanding what they were doing relative to their peers. So that really helped. And the third thing, which probably is the most important one, is to make sure that you know what you're measuring. Um, in the sense that, you know, for us, the management survey, let's say it's 18 questions, but it's actually, we use 18 questions to measure one concept. And often I see surveys where there are 18 questions used to measure 18 things. And at the end of the day, you have so much noise in the data that it's very hard to, you, you put all that effort to collect it and then it's very hard to use it. So you know, have one idea, one concept that you want to measure and then go all out in the field. Uh, but you have to have some clarity on what's, what goes in the survey before you go. You have to pilot, you have to try it cognitively test it. And there is a lot of pre-work that goes into this type of data collections. Right. And, and I have to say that you put a lot of these data sets, the ones you are collecting are out there. It's a, it's a great public good for people who Absolutely. want to do more research and management. It's and I would love for people. First of all, the data is usable there. It's anonymized, but you know we also happy to to share. We ha we're happy to share the data with the researchers. We have all the methodology on the website. Uh, I think right. there are some old videos of how on how to run a survey. So it's uh, it's really a common good. And then, as you know, we also organize a yearly conference where people who are using this methods. Which is a great methods, conference. Yeah. 
we just get together and we, you know, we nerd out explaining all the different ways in which we've expanded the survey, either going after a different sector or um, measuring new things or running experiments, which is really like the frontier of where, of where this literature right. is right now. Yeah. Great. Well, Rafaela, it's been so great to talk to you. Um, I appreciate on behalf of one, one human more on the planet, all, all the insights <laughs> that you're giving us. Um, and um, what, I wonder what's, what's next. I mean, you're telling us you want to work more on the hospital and health workers management. What, what, what's, what, how do you see your research moving in the next few years? Yeah, so look, I, I would love for the research to be useful, to be honest. So if I can be useful in helping, uh, you know, in understanding the potential role of management in hospitals, that would be amazing. Another area where I really th hope that we can make progress is, you know, how do we help people uh, reskill or, you know, change jobs or upskill? Um, that, that is such a big, I mean, my, my concern is that that's going to be such a big part of our life going forward in the next few years after this, uh, this crisis. And I would love to, to see if, if it's possible to help with some very practical um, practical maybe experiments or studies that help us understand what are the frictions that right. you know might prevent some of this reskilling from happening yeah well that's fascinating we'll be of course in the lookout and um uh, well it's and it's been great to chat to chat with you and to have you on thank you thank you danny nice seeing you